Well, today's uh, sermon is actually a challenge to grow our church. And uh, real quick, a couple of asides is, one, you think, well, we're supposed to grow the church, not our particular church, and that's absolutely true, but we grow churches on a local level, and I would expect everybody that's going to a good Bible church all over not only the United States but the world to have a deep, passionate desire to grow their church. And that's how we grow the body of Christ, by growing our local church. So uh, if that's a, a little hang-up for you, I would say please set that aside because it will result in, in, uh, in a lack of growth and a lack of inactivity. So let's, let's pray. Dear Lord God in heaven, Father, our prayer to start the service today about how beautiful you are, how beautiful this day is, how beautiful our brothers and sisters here are, Lord. Father, my heart echoes those words, and I want to say thank you, Father, Lord, sometimes we don't feel worthy to be in church. Sometimes we look around and everybody else seems to polish up so nice. Lord, thank you that we're worthy to be here today because of you. And we're worthy to even speak with you. And our prayers, your word says our prayers enter right into your throne room in heaven, Lord. All because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins. Thank you, God, for sending your Holy Spirit to be with us, to guide us, to convict us of our sins, to comfort us, Lord, to lead us into an understanding of your scriptures, Lord, to empower us to share our faith with others. Lord, I pray for each one of us, Father, that we truly want to know you, not just going through a church ritual, not just going to church because it's a habit, but that deep down inside, Lord, we just yearn to know you and to know you better. God, I pray that you lead our church that we're not satisfied, Lord, to grow in numbers if we're shallow on the inside, a mile wide but an inch deep. Lord, I pray that you make each one of us hungry to see this city, this region brought to the cross, Lord, to see revival. This is a beautiful part of the world you've given us here in southern Wisconsin. We're blessed everywhere we look, Lord. Father, please help us to reach the hearts and minds of the people around us, Father. Father, I pray that we don't take casually the eternal destinies of people who don't know you yet. Lord, it was love that drove you to the cross. It was love that held you to the cross. Lord, please, I want to live my life for love. I want this church to exist to love people and to bring them close to you, Jesus. I pray that we never think the purpose of church is keeping the doors open or or surviving another year, Lord, but we're, we're hungry to know you. We're hungry to... Build up your body and knowledge. We're hungry to love you and love one another. And we're hungry for souls, Lord, eagerly desiring to share this good news of salvation, of forgiveness, of acceptance through the blood of Jesus. God, we ask you to lead our church. We also ask that you would lead 
this service, the message. Father, you would lead each one of us right now that our hearts would be prepared for the study of your word, Lord, that you would lead our minds into wisdom, that you keep us sharp, awake, alert. Father, do with us as you will, and please glorify yourself at this time. And thank you for listening. Amen. Has uh, anybody ever seen, uh, I'd like a show of hands, how many people have seen the Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights? Yeah, not, not on the internet or television, but in person. About half the folks. Uh, when I saw them, it was many years ago, and I was a kid, and we were on Wildcat Mountain. And it was, we were camping, and it was dark out, and you started to see these great big gray bands start to move and then shimmer. But I've never seen the, the full color ones. Has anybody seen the full color ones? Where were you? Wow. In Evansville. Wow. Yeah, now I'm jealous. <laughs> I uh, found this description of them online. I've heard them described before that northern lights are kind of like neon lights. You know, you have gas and you have gas in a glass tube and then you shoot electricity through there and it charges the particles and you get different colored neon lights. Well, I found this cool description online. It was, they spelled it the Northern Lights Center with a T-R-E because it was Canadian. And so I, I'm sorry about that as I present this to you, but you probably can't tell the spellings as I read it. But I just want to apologize in case you could hear a little Canadian sneaking out. Uh, the bright dancing lights of the aurora are actually collisions between electronically charged particles from the sun that enter the Earth's atmosphere. The lights are seen above the magnetic poles of the northern and southern hemispheres. They are known as, known as the aurora borealis in the north and the aurora australis in the south. Auroral displays appear in many colors, although pale green and pink are the most common. Shades of red, yellow, green, blue, and violet have been reported. The lights appear in many forms from patches or scattered uh, clouds of light to stream, streamers, arcs, rippling curtains, uh, shooting rays of light that, uh, that light up the sky with an eerie glow. They can even light up the ground with the color. Uh, the ones we saw were grayish, but they were moving and rippling, these massive bands in the sky. It was just gorgeous. Uh, the northern lights are actually a result of collisions between gaseous particles in the Earth's atmosphere with charred par parched particles released from the sun's atmosphere. Variations in color are due to the types of gas that are colliding. The most common auroral color, a pale yellowish green, is produced by oxygen molecules located about 60 miles above the Earth. Rare all-red auroras are produced by high-altitude oxygen at heights of up to 200 miles. Nitrogen produces blue or purplish-red aura. And I, I guess the auras can actually form up to 400 miles above the Earth. And I saw a picture that uh, NASA astronauts took of the aurora from above the Earth, and it's just, here's the Earth, and then there's these arcing curtains coming up from the northern hemisphere. It's very pretty. Uh, I took my family up north this week, all the way up to the very tip of the UP, the farthest north you could go in the lower 48, to a tiny village named Copper Harbor. Uh, if you go to Rhinelander, you're about halfway there. And uh, we went because uh, it was supposed to be one of the best spots in the lower 48 states to see the northern lights and October is supposed to be one of the best months and the sun is on 11 year cycle and the peak hit two years ago but it was still supposed to be a good year and and uh, people were saying they'd seen a lot of aurora up there this year and so we went up there and we were there for a day and, and we didn't see any aurora you know the odds were small but I wanted to take the risk uh, just the morning before we arrived at 5 o'clock in the morning, they said there was a beautiful display. Uh, so that was close. And remember this year when we had the, uh, the uh, eclipse of the, uh, of the moon, it was the blood moon, it was so beautiful. It, up in uh, Copper Harbor, I guess all the people were out in the lawn chairs watching it because they had the blood moon 
and they had the northern lights across the horizon. They had both at the same time. So what, a, what an amazing thing that would have been. We went, even though I knew the odds were small, because we wanted to go. That makes sense. And I'm hoping that's why you're at church today, uh, because you wanted to be in the presence of the Lord. Uh, it was difficult, and we had to make this long run up there quick and uh, spend a day and then a long run back. We had an amazingly good time. Uh, we went hiking. Been wanting to do that all year with my family. I didn't find any mosquitoes. There was very few bugs. The weather was gorgeous. The sky was bright blue. Uh, we've gone up to Hayward a few times over the last several years, not for a couple years, but, and we get up there and we've always gone too late in October or November and we missed all the colors. This year we hit it right on. And I'm surprised how much green we have down here because we just came from up north. We, it was snowing when we left up north. Uh, we hit the colors amazing, just reds and oranges and yellows like you wouldn't believe. And on mountain ridges, and, and it's the contrast with the stars, the sky, and just enjoying the Lord. And looking at the stars, I saw the best view of the Milky Way that I've ever seen before in the nighttime sky. And that was gorgeous. And I, I was so happy to be able to show that to my kids. My kids have never seen the Aurora. I wanted them to see it. We took a shot, and it was worth it. We walked on the beach, and uh, there was bad weather coming. And so the Lake Superior was all churned up. And we stood in the spray as the beach waves came crashing down and listened as all the gravel, like small, round, smooth stones, would as the water came up at them, as the water came down. The waves were crashing so hard that these stones were being thrown up in the air by the, by the waves. And so you're standing there, stones being kicked up, and it's just gorgeous. And uh, then that evening in our cabin, which was surprisingly clean and well, the bed was about, my feet were hanging off the end, but it was, it was nice. The shower, I had, the shower was hitting me in the chest, and I had to, about three quarters of an inch with the roof or the ceiling right there, trying to. The, that evening, we, we read comic books. We read our Bible. Uh, we we uh, read a sto story about Curdie and the Goblin. That was good. Uh, we played... What's the name of that game we played? Catchphrase. And laughed so hard, we had to stop because I couldn't catch my breath. And I, was, I said, I'm not doing well here. we got to stop. Such, and the kids were so good. And kids, I could do with more of that. I mean, uh, they were so good the whole time we were there. It's just a joy to be around, and it was such a wonder. Uh, on the way up, uh, we stopped at a park in Rhinelander, land of the Hodag. Some of you know what that is. For a, <laughs> for a picnic. And, and we, we threw the football around, and that was so fun. And again, beautiful day. However, when we got up to Eagle River, which we had to pass through on our way north, which, by the way, we stopped for Tremblay's Fudge. There, that is a wonderful thing, Tremblay's Fudge. If, if you've been having trouble praising the Lord recently, <laughs> that fudge will do it for you. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Gave me a 10% discount. <laughs> Why did we stop at Tremblay's Fudge? Because we wanted to. Fortunately, we stopped because at that time, I realized I had lost my car keys. Now, you're wondering how I got to Rhine, from Rhinelander to, to, to Eagle River without keys. The thing is, is, we've got that new car out there. I'm driving a gray car instead of a black car. We've got a great deal on it. I'm paying less per month in payments. I'm, here's, I'm, re, I'm rejoicing every time I think about this. I'm paying less to drive a brand new car than I would have to purchase the old one used. So this is a great deal for me. But the new one has this thing where you push a button to turn on the car. 
If I was alone, the car would not, have start, would not have started if I didn't have my car keys. But because Yumi was sitting next to me, her car keys triggered, and I pushed a button, and we drove. Thankfully, the town was only 30 minutes away. So that's 30 minutes. 30 minutes back to the park, praying, you know. We'll have a good time if I've got to pay for new keys with the fob. They're going to charge me a lot. But Lord, I would really like to find my keys. And I got there, and oh, they're not there. Oh, there they are. <laughs> Found the keys 30 minutes back. So that added an hour onto a long, already long trip. Why did I go back for those keys? Because I wanted to. Because I thought it was worth it, even adding another hour trip, even adding some difficulty. Many of the things we do is because we want to do them. We pay taxes because we want to. No, 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 you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't pay them. Uh, some people would rather go to jail, rather not support their country, and so they choose not to pay taxes. The rest of us who are honoring the Lord when he says, render to Caesar what is Caesar's, we pay our taxes because we want to. I didn't say we like to, but we would rather pay our taxes than face the consequences for not. Uh, we go to work every day. Why? I don't want to go to work. Yes, you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't go. The reason you're going is because you like the paycheck. And nobody so far has decided to pay you for not going to work. We go to the dentist. Listen, we go to the dentist because we want to. Because it hurts too bad if you don't go. Or you're worried about what will happen if you don't go. We pay our bills because we want to. You know, it's, isn't it fun when you actually have money to pay your bills? Sometimes it doesn't work out that way. But when you can f pay all your bills and, and you say, thank you, God, I've got nothing but I got to pay my bills, it feels good. And, and we want to pay them because we like electricity. We, we want to pay it because we think having gas in the home is good for cooking and heating. Uh, incidentally, by the way, brothers and sisters, that's why we gossip, because we want to. That's why you pout, nurse a grudge, throw fits, all that. There are many other things, though, that happen to us. We live in a fallen world that we have to deal or cope with and we don't want to have to deal or cope with these things. Accidents, illnesses, the consequences of other people's actions, the death of people we love, uh, things so horrible to even contemplate them we can hardly breathe that almost stops your heart just to think about losing people you love. Uh, that's because we're not all powerful and we can't do whatever we want. Can't. But God can. And Jesus, while he was in heaven, and in heaven he could, he could do whatever he wanted to. He had all the glory of heaven. He had all the worship of all the countless angels. A, play, a paradise, a place of wonder and beauty. A place without hardship or tears. And he chose to leave that because he saw a world he loved, and that world was full of death and darkness and fear, terror and anguish, and this cries of people who are in despair, and there's no hope in death, hopelessness all around. And he said, I'm going to empty myself of all the prerequisites of kingship. I'm going to take my glory and set it aside. I'm going to be born as a little baby, a little helpless baby, born in a manger with animals all around in a small, dirty place to poor parents, born as a human being, born so that he could die for us and to suffer the rejection the abuse, the, the scorn, the hatred that was just poured on him so he could be hammered to a cross so he could give his perfect life as a sacrifice for us and pay for our nastiness. And I said this before, and I think I've only said it once because it's so brutal, 
I hate, can't even face it myself, let alone say it, that every time we sin, we are adding to the weight of the cross. Why did he do that? Because he, he wanted to. I had a, a, a teacher at school who once said, Jesus gets a lot of credit because he sacrificed himself for people. But you know, we're all selfish creatures and we do what we want. Some people want to read Playboy. And Jesus apparently had this suicidal tendency. He wanted to die. Uh, we all do what we want to do. And I, I said, you know, I, I didn't bother for him to call him. He just, you know, I think that most people would say there's a difference between people who are dying to help somebody else and somebody just living their lives for their own selfish purposes. I can see that, Dan. I can see why my, some people might say that. Business, family, all of these reasons that we give for not following Christ. We read about them, but we don't know their names because they did not follow Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we want our names to be known in heaven. We want our names to, to have impact in eternity. We want to live lives that count. And you don't get this by saying no to Jesus. This happens when we say yes to Jesus. Uh, We, what are we doing here this morning? Uh, I don't preach sermons because I like to hear my own voice. And uh, I hope we're not just coming so we can check off a list, did the sermon thing this week, did the church thing this week. But when we prepare these messages and when we're here together as a group, God, we want you, Father, please, I'm praying right now, right? God, please break us and remake us. We don't want to be the same people who came in today. We want to encounter your Holy Spirit and we want to be new. And Lord, we want to say yes to you. Jesus says something and we will either do it or not do it because we either want to do it or we don't want to do it. Those men said, I'll follow you, Jesus, but got a lot of other priorities. And Jesus says, no, don't put your hand to the plow and then look back. You get after it. You go because the kingdom of God is worth it. Now, this is what Jesus is teaching. Now, Brothers and sisters, we know that a good Christian who's following Christ for everything he's worth is going to be a better father, better mother, better child, better citizen of whatever country they're living in, uh, better worker, right? I, I always try to say Christian workers should be hard workers. They should be honest workers. They should give the boss everything, whether he's looking or not. We bring glory to God by being good neighbors, good friends. All this allows us an opportunity to talk about the gospel, expand the kingdom. But let's remember all those things are in service of the kingdom. I'm trying to make this difficult. I, I think Christ made it difficult. Everything in our life is in service of the kingdom because why? Well, Paul called himself a slave, doulos was the word he used. Indentured servant meaning he sold himself into slavery, means it's voluntary slavery, meaning if you were bought by the blood of Christ, you no longer belong to yourself. So as servants of the living God, we have to think of his mind, what is important to him, because that's what I ought to be about. Is everybody tracking? Is that making sense? And, and I hope it makes more sense, or even if it made perfect sense before, I hope that that by talking about this on Sunday morning, it sticks with us a little bit more during the week. And I'm talking to myself. I'm preaching to myself, right? During the week, let's be people that put the kingdom first in everything. That means we don't have the right 
to pout. That means that we don't have the right to hold a grudge. That means we don't say, well, I got to do whatever we think we got to do that is going to make it harder for other people to see Jesus. Our job is to make it easy for people to find Christ. I think that was an appropriate time to say amen. Uh, amen. Our job is to help people find Christ. Amen? Amen. amen. Uh, when you say amen, as a group, we're joining together saying, I agree with that. Lord, let this be true in our lives, right? That's why it's, it's a good thing to, to, to be in it together. That, uh, that whole thing about letting your name echo in eternity and, and you'll be known because he said yes is, is a very good sermon. I think it's a true sermon. But unfortunately, the context, the very next chapter, we read about the 72 that Christ sends out, and we don't know their names. But they all said yes to Jesus. Uh, so that doesn't negate what I just said, because you know who does know their names is God in heaven. And actually, the early church made some lists, and it included people like Barnabas and, and Silas and, and Stephen, uh, all the first, uh, uh, Aaron, what are you? Deacons. All oh, thank you. Uh, I was thinking of diakonoi, which is Greek, but yeah, deacon. And uh, so the, the original church had lists, and they may be true, because this is very early in the history of the church. But they're not in Scripture. We don't really know. Uh, so we have this list of, 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 of 72 fellas, and we don't know their names. Most people who have said yes to Jesus over the years are not Billy Graham. In other words, the world doesn't know you and me. They don't. Most of the world does not know you and I exist. We said yes to Christ but that doesn't mean we're going to be famous. That doesn't mean we're going to be in the spotlight. That doesn't mean that we're going to have everybody's attention. A lot of service to God goes on behind the scenes. Uh, I'm always blessed. I'm always looking out. And, and, you know, sometimes I miss it, but I'm watching. Who's doing the thankless jobs? They're cleaning the church when nobody's looking. They're picking up chairs when nobody's looking. They're praying with somebody when nobody's looking. And it's not so they can have the spotlight. It's because they want to serve. And I always... I, not always. I often shoot up a prayer. Thank you, God. I love to see that. Sometimes I even go and, and pat you on the back and say, good job. Not always. But God sees even if, if Pastor Dave and Pastor Dan miss, right? God sees. And, and maybe the whole congregation doesn't notice the work you do, but God sees the work you do. When we say yes to God, our lives count even when people don't notice. And I want us to find our value in saying yes to God and not find our value because we're the noisiest or we're, the biggest spot, we're in the biggest spotlight or, or anything like that. Most people who say yes to Jesus over the years uh, are, are forgotten, but not forgotten in heaven. Yet they served. They had a role. They had a part to play because, listen to this, God always uses a willing heart. Don't say I'm too shy. Don't say I'm too sickly. Don't say I'm too tired. Don't say I'm too, I'm too uh, young, too old. Don't say I'm not smart as some of those other folks. Don't say any of that. God will always use a willing heart. When, uh, on our leadership team, when we meet on Wednesday nights, one of the things that we've ta spoken about many times is that uh, availability counts for more than talent. You can have the most talented person but if they're not stepping up to serve, they're not helping to build the body of Christ, they're not using their abilities for the kingdom. But a person who says, here am I, send me. Here am I, use me. Here am I, speak through me. Here am I, let me carry tables. That's a person that God can use. A willing heart. And it doesn't matter if you get accolades or attention. <coughs> well, let me correct that. I'm always giving it people accolades and attention, right? I'm always, Jason, you're awesome, man. And I love what you do in the church. You're invaluable. I do that because now he has to deal with his pride before God. <laughs> uh, you know, each one of us as individuals, let's serve without needing everybody's approval, everybody's attention, everybody's praise. And yet, one another, there's nobody who has too much encouragement. Toriano, I think you're awesome. 
you have been you have made the church a better place and let's do that for one another let's heap praise let's heap, heap encouragement on one another uh yeah if it doesn't come keep your attitude right before the lord but let's be encouraging one another let's let's be building each other up because there's nobody who's too encouraged there's there's not even such a thing uh but but you know even if you're famous at foundation bible church and Adam's saying, yeah, I'm pretty famous here. I think everybody knows me, and you are absolutely correct. And both Adams, I'm looking at you both. You're, you're in line today, so I can just get you both. Uh, even if you're famous here, we're not famous in the world, right? Nobody knows we exist except God, and God will use a willing heart. So, brothers and sisters, are you willing? Here's a better question. Do you want to be willing? Because, God, please, <laughs> I want you to use me. Lord, if you can use what you see before you, God, go ahead. You know I'm not this, I'm not that, I'm not this. I fail here, I'm not up to snuff here. I, all these things, Lord. But anyways, anyways, Japanese, Tony Kaku, Tony Kaku, I'm here. Can you use me? And God will always say, my child, I'm just waiting for you to say that. And I will use you. And we're together, God's going to use you and I to grow the kingdom of God. And you don't have to be talented. All you have to do is be willing. The truth is, again, that a willing heart is more important than, than uh, talent. Availability is more important than all the giftedness. But what does that also mean? That means the barrier to being used by God to build his kingdom. Listen, the barrier for God to use you, for God to use our church, it's not a financial barrier. It's not a physical barrier. And we, we told you the story a few years ago by the old woman in her, her bed who evangelized all her neighbors by inviting them over. They would come. Spend time with her. She just talked with them. Pretty soon the whole block was saved. The barrier is not financial. The barrier is not physical. The barrier is not how many gifts I have or what gifts I don't have. The barrier is an unwilling heart. Isn't that the flip side? God can use a willing heart. So what's stopping God from using you? What's stopping God from using me? What's stopping God from using our church to reach our community? Well, an unwilling heart. Because... We don't want to. Because when I tell about people about Jesus, it's embarrassing. Because I've blown it so many times, and I've used such foul language, my coworkers don't want to hear it, and I don't want to admit that a change has happened in my life and I'm trying to be a new person. I don't want to tell my neighbors I'm a Christian because that might put me in the spotlight. They might judge me more harshly. I don't want to lose my opportunity for advancement at work. I don't want to upset my family because they always get upset when I talk about Jesus. Okay, let's read a section now about a group of people. And this is a long section, but I want to let you know ahead of time. We're not going to, we often take short sections and really dive into them. This time we're just going to do the panorama and hit a few main points, and we're not going to dive into it. There's a, a group of people that are known as the 72. Now, if you're looking at your Bible and saying, what is he talking about? Because my Bible says the 70. There's a reason for that. There are different ancient witnesses, different ancient texts. Some of them, you always hear about those big differences in the Bible. What would I keep telling you? The differences are mostly dates, numbers, the end of Mark. And if you put all the differences together, it's about two pages in the Bible, and none of it touches on doctrine. Here's one of the differences. The reason people talk about the differences that are there is because the rest of the Bible, 99.9 something percent, is rock solid and we have it in different ancient documents, in different countries, in different languages, and when we put them together, they're the same. Here is an honest difference. Some of the ancient documents say 72 and some of the ancient documents say 70, and depending on which ones they, the translators of your Bible used as a priority, some will say, some Bibles are going to say 72 and some are going to say 70. If you lose your faith over that, you are gone anyways. <laughs> you know, sorry. 
I can't help you with that. Uh, God has brought us a rock-solid Bible. Nothing, the vast majority of it is substantiated across all the manuscript witnesses. It's rock-solid. And there are some things like this that have crept in over the years, and we're not sure uh, whether it was 70 or 72. Uh, because thus saith Bob. And, and uh, I wasn't going to say that, but... The, uh, the funny thing is, the funny thing is, Jesus may have chosen the number 72. Remember when we studied about the Mount of Transfiguration? And, Je and they, Jesus was talking with Moses. He says that they were talking about the time of his exodus. And Jesus was going to leave this world. And he was going to lead out the captives. Well, Moses chose 70 elders. Oh, that affirms the 72. You know, if Jesus kind of be, a, uh, if Moses was kind of like a pre picture of. He chose 70 elders to help him lead, and then two more joined later. So you get the number 72. Why did Jesus choose 72? Nobody knows, but it's possible, again, he was echoing uh, Moses there. So he sent out his 72 followers. And uh, again, we're not going to hit on everything, but we're just going to hit some major themes. So it's Luke chapter 10 from verse 1. After this, after, so this is intentional. I said this, that... Uh, Mark and Luke, they're not always chronological, but they group ideas together. So he just grouped this clump of three people that said no to Jesus. Now we're going to talk about people who said yes to Jesus. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others. This is in addition to the 12. He sent them out to twos. Remember when he sent out the 12 by twos? And they would go to different places and they would preach the gospel. Uh, to, to every town and every place that he was to send them, he told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his field. Brothers and sisters, have you done that recently? Lord God, there are plenty of people that I passed this morning who are sleeping in on Sunday mornings. Father, there are plenty of people going to the gym on Sunday mornings. There are plenty of people out jogging Sunday mornings. There are plenty of people who are doing yard work Sunday mornings. Lord God, there are so many people that haven't made you a priority in their lives. The harvest is so plentiful. Lord, we need more workers. Please send workers. Jesus said, pray for workers. Okay? Right? Everybody saw that? Yep. Then he said, go! <laughs> Mine has an exclamation point. You know, there was no exclamation points in the original uh, language, but there's a reason the translators put an exclamation there, point there, because it's an imperative. It's a command. He is saying, Go! You have to get out there in order to share the gospel. I am sending you out like lambs among wolves, which again just shows Jesus probably wouldn't have had a successful megachurch. Go! I'm sending you out there to get a bigger car, bigger house, bigger wife. Whatever. Where did that come from? That came from my Uncle Dan. That's where that came from. He used to preach that, and uh, boy, his sermons have really stuck with me. And <laughs> Go! And he says, listen, I understand what I'm doing. I'm sending you some rough places. Lord, I keep sharing my faith and nobody's listening. Some people are making fun of me. He said, keep going. I sent you out like a lamb among wolves. I knew what I was doing. Jesus knew what he was doing when he sent us out to work some difficult fields. And he says, do not take a purse or a bag or sandals. Do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first say, peace to this house. If someone who promotes peace is there, your peace will rest on them. If not, it will return to you. Stay there, eating and drinking whatever they give to you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is offered to you. Heal the sick, of, uh, uh, sick who are there and tell them, tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, even the dust of your town we wipe from our feet as a warning to you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God has come near to you. I tell you, it will be more bearable on that day, the judgment day for Sodom, than it was for that town. Wow. Woe to you, Chorazon. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For the, if the miracles that were performed in you had been seen and performed in Tyre and Sidon, these, these Canaanite, these Phoenician cities, 
They would have repented long ago, sitting in sackcloth and ashes, mourning over their sins, but it will be more bearable for Tyre and Sidon at the judgment day than for you. And for you, Capernaum, and you, Capernaum, will be lifted to the heavens. No, you will go down to hell. Whoever, see, didn't I tell you, whenever we, whenever we uh, share Jesus, we try to, we try to pretty him up. I don't think that's my job. I don't think that's your job to make Jesus more palatable to our culture. We just got to preach what he said. He's God. He's our Savior. And he loves us. Whoever listens to you, because he knows this can be hard, so he's saying these 72, whoever listens to you listens to me. Whoever rejects you they're really rejecting me. But whoever rejects me is rejecting him who sent me. The 72 returned with joy. So they were sent out like sheep among wolves. They were sent out to people who reject them. They came back rejoicing and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, and I don't know what Jesus did, but I always in my mind picture Jesus going like this. He said, Lord, even the demons believe it. And Jesus goes, I saw Satan cast down from heaven. You know, I, I don't know how he did it, but I always picture he's like remembering, looking off into the distance. Uh, but he gives us a little insight to what happened. He's talking about when Satan rebelled and was kicked out of heaven. He said, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Guys, in context, he's not talking about snakes and scorpions, poison not affecting you. He's talking about demons, isn't he? Let's look at the context. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you. Don't rejoice at the ministry. Rejoice that your name are written in heaven. See how that tied into what we're talking about? Don't rejoice in, in success in ministry. Don't rejoice in, in, in the, <coughs> all the accomplishments that are going. Rejoice that your name is known in heaven. Serve. And rejoice that God, God knows your name. God knows your name. At that time, Jesus, full of joy. Isn't that beautiful? His workers came back and they've been sharing the gospel. And Jesus is full of joy. And he's joy, full of joy through the Holy Spirit. So we need more joy. Get close to the Holy Spirit. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth. Because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to the babes. And for some reason, when I was in college, I thought that, well, I didn't really think. (laughs) So it's right there in Scripture. Women have more spiritual knowledge than men. Thank you, God, you revealed this to the babes. Yes, Father, for that is what you are pleased to do. Uh, Moving on. No further explanation. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows uh, who is the Son except the Father, and no one knows who is the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see. For I tell you that many of the prophets in the Old Testament, and many of the kings, they wanted to see what you're seeing, but they could not see it, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. And by the way, when Jesus... People wish, I wish I was in the Old Testament times. Jesus says, what you're seeing right here, it's better. And then today we say, I wish I I could have been in the Old Testament times with Moses, or I wish I could have walked with Jesus. But Jesus, when he went away, said, this is better for you that I leave, so you can receive the Holy Spirit. So we have the Holy Spirit, and we have the record of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Uh, let's, Let's actually stop wishing for things that can't happen, and actually start believing Jesus when he said, this is better for you. I do. Thank you, God, that you've given me the Holy Spirit. I'm such a mess. I can't believe trying to follow you without the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful for your Holy Spirit, encouraging me, me, uh, reminding me of your grace, challenging me, not not satisfied. God, you love me so much that you accept me as I am, but you love me so much you're not satisfied to leave me where I'm at. And I thank you for that, God, even though it hurts. Some of the key points from this passage we just read. We do what we want to do for the most part, right? Jesus did what he wanted to do. Jesus could have told these guys to do anything. 
He could have said, I really, really want you all to become circus performers. You know how those clowns all get in the car? I think that's awesome. I want to see 72 of you in a Volkswagen. He could, he could do whatever he want. <coughs> he could have told them, now here's what we're going to do. I've got 72, but you're 72 good men. I want you to arm yourselves. I want you to train. If we hit the government at just the right time in the right place, we can take power. He could have said that. Jesus, God on earth, could have said anything, and what he told them was, go bless people, bring healing, preach the kingdom. I can't overstate how important this is. Jesus could have told them to do anything. What he told them was to bring healing, bring blessing, preach the kingdom. If Jesus were here today, he could tell us anything. But I have a feeling he'd tell us to go. Go. Jesus tells us what to pray for. There's a lot of things, well, I think it's okay to pray for this, and maybe it's okay to pray for that. And you know, the Bible tells us to bring all your prayers and petitions to the Lord. Don't stop worrying about what's okay to pray about and start praying. Uh, you know, I know that our life is not all about health and money. I know that. Do you know that I regularly pray for you guys to be healthy and have business success? I want you guys to do well. Uh, let's pray for another, one another. Let's encourage one another. Let's, let's not be jealous for one another. Let's cheer each other on. Uh, but, but life is so much more. In, in a, if somebody living in poverty who loves the Lord, is on fire for Jesus, can have more joy, more peace, and be a, a greater person in heaven than a person with all the ones and in zeros and dollar signs in their bank. Let's live for Jesus. Let's put him first. Jesus, what he told us to do, this is a prayer. He said, pray for workers. So when's the last time you prayed, Lord, send our church more workers. We need more people who are working. We need more people who are going out. We need people who are just engines of, of invitation, inv engines of sharing the gospel, engines of working with the youth. Well, Lord, we just, need, we just need people who are, I'm fired up because I know what God can do with willing hearts. I know what he can do with willing hearts. Pray for more workers. What could God do with our church in the next 10 years if we get a whole passel? I mean, we already have a willing church. Our church is so awesome. Whenever something happens, everybody jumps in to contribute, right? That's, that's a hallmark. We, we, we rightfully are proud of that, and we should continue. But what if we get a whole passel more? I'm talking a whole, whole boat full of more workers. What could God do with more? Jesus said, pray for more workers. Uh, again, you know, he could have told us to pray for anything. Pray for more money for the church? That's okay, but he didn't say that, did he? Pray for new carpeting? That would be wonderful. By the way, the new carpeting out there looks gorgeous. That's, that's okay to pray for those things, again. But that's not what he said. That's not wrong, but that's not what he said. Pray for new paint? I was talking to, the, to my daughters this week. What do you not like about the church? Such a dangerous question. <laughs> they really, I think, rightfully say it needs to look more modern. We need to, we need to modernize. But that's not what Christ said. Christ said, pray for more workers. And I don't care how old your building is. I don't know how decrepit your carpeting is. I don't care how many leaks you've got in your roof. If you've got 20, 30, 40, 70 people who are on fire for Jesus, Holy Spirit's going to do something. It's going to be beautiful. And I don't care what color the carpet is if you've got willing hearts and a positive attitude. Say, Lord, here we are. Please use us and watch what the Holy Spirit can do. And it's exciting. Jesus, number three, Jesus sends his followers out like gentle sheep among wolves. He did not send out his followers like T Rexes that eat wolves. A lot of times we go into the world like, I want to knock out the world. I want to hurt some people. I want to show them the truth. I want to. I don't know if we lead people into heaven by tell them, holding signs, tell them how stupid they are. I don't know. Now, they do need to be convicted of their sin. We're not going to be quiet about, you know, this is sin. It's wrong because. In order to fall at your feet before Jesus, you've got to know you need a Savior, right? But when all people see is anger and, and hatred and picketing, 
I'm not sure that works. Uh, we're not like T-wolves among wolves. Uh, but here's something that corresponds to that. Number four, Jesus also taught there's a time when people are not responding to the gospel. Jesus actually told this his follower, to his followers, move on. That friendship, you've invested in these people for how many years? They're, no longer clo they're not any closer to Jesus than when you started. You better start reaching out to different people. I'm not saying we write people off. We're, we're not God. We don't know when somebody doesn't have a shot anymore. But the way we use our resources for God, our, 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 our uh, finances, we also have to use our time for God. And there are times when we have to say, I need to focus on a different group of people, start inviting them to church, start inviting them to Bible study, because these other folks, they're not responding, and they haven't responded for quite some time. Number five, when his followers were rejected, Jesus took that personal that has really been comforting to me over the years because God has blessed me to lead dozens and dozens and dozens of people to Christ. God's blessed me that a number of people uh, that I've been able to disciple, lead to Christ or, or disciple, are now in full-time ministry. Um, people have marriages together. They're, they're serving together. All that is wonderful. You know what? So many people have told me no. Way more people have told me, no, they don't want Jesus. Some with tears in their eyes, several times people with tears in their eyes say, I don't want Jesus, Dan. And it has been a blessing for me to know that they're rejecting Jesus. They're rejecting Jesus, that he's with me, that he takes it personal. It's hard to face rejection. I hate it. I'm not a fan of rejection. Uh, I'm wimpy. It's so good to know Jesus is with me. Because I can't do this. Can't do it. But if he's with me, then all things are possible. Amen? Amen? Number six, all Christians should rejoice that their names are in the book of life more than they rejoice even in useful ministry. I think it's good to rejoice in being used. Thank you, God, for using a bonehead like me. God, you can use idiots. Thank you, Lord. I'm not looking at the church right now, okay? I'm looking at myself. Thank you, Lord, that you can use somebody like me. But all, much, much more, I want to thank you, Lord, that my name's written in the book of life. That I've been saved by the blood of Jesus Christ, and he doesn't lose one child out of his hands. He's not going to lose track of me. More than fruitful ministry, more than usefulness, Thank you, God, that you, can, that, uh, that you put our names in the book of life when we humble ourselves and put our faith in Jesus Christ, and that's for everybody. Okay, <clears throat> a little while ago I asked you, if you could do anything, what would you do? Maybe a more impactful question would be, if Jesus could ask you to do anything, what would he ask you to do? And I already know the answer. And I'm not speaking for God here. I'm not making this up. I know the answer because we just saw him say go. And because just like he sent out his apostles, remember he got his apostles and he sent them out. Then he got a 72. What did he do? He sent them out. Prior to returning to heaven, a person's last will and testament, their last words on earth, so important, right? Prior to his ascension back into heaven, at the very end when he wanted to sum up his ministry with Jesus was about to be taken from this earth. The Holy Spirit was coming, right? What were the last things he said? And we have a record for that because God wanted this record to be written down. He wanted this record to be written down so that all the millions upon millions and, millions and millions and millions and millions of Christians, people that would come to faith after that point, <coughs> when Jesus Christ ascended to heaven, there's only a small group of followers, but he knew all these people from all over the world would come and put their faith and God wanted them to know what was on his heart. Matthew 28, 26 through 30, Jesus says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of every ethnic group. That's the word nations there is ethnos. Baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. Don't, don't just get these oh, I believe in Jesus, then they go on their way and ignore God for the rest of their lives. Teach them. Together we're going to learn what it means to be true followers of Jesus. 
And remember, Jesus said, because this is a hard job, <coughs> I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Isn't that neat? That the book of Matthew starts by saying Jesus will be called Emmanuel, God with us. And then it ends by Jesus saying, I'm going to be with you to the very end of the age. His last words, you know what? Jesus could have said anything else, but he didn't. Again, I can't overstate how important this is. And brothers and sisters, if we want to call ourselves followers of Jesus, we got to get this. It's important. Jesus commanded us to go and make disciples. This is what our life is for. We've been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. This is our priority. All right, here's the challenge. Here's the challenge. We are a small church, tiny church, little bitty church. Uh, about 100 people probably call this church their home, some in and out. We've got a good core, though. We average about 60 to 70. If you add those in who uh, attend in the evening service. When we started this church 12 years ago, we had like 8 or 10 people. We had 8 or 10 people, and somehow we went in faith to see what God could do. If 12 years ago we could have started with 60 or 70 people, how excited we would have been and said, we've got 60 or 70 people to tackle this city. We've got a core of 60 or 70 committed people. Lord, what can you do with us? Well, the challenge is what can God do with this group right here today? What can God do with your life? How can your life matter in eternity? Again, let's say yes to Jesus. Well, here we are. Isn't that neat? We are approximately the same number as Christ had when he sent out the 72. God took a handful of us. He took first his 12. 12 years ago, God took a handful of us and built this church. What can he do with 72 approximately willing hearts? What can God do with our church? We're approaching the end of 2015. I don't want to ever do churches business, business as usual. Just one year, mark it down, go into another year. And I don't think we have to measure the slow, steady growth. Thankfully, Lord, we've had a couple, twice we dipped down, but slow, steady growth between that very small group to where we are today. I don't think we have to measure what God can do in the future based upon what he did in the past. There's no reason why 72 people can't bring 72 people we actually double in a year. See, that's... I want us to have a vision of what could happen if we all start inviting people, if we all start sharing our faith. If the Lord should tarry, I really hope that each one of us gets excited by that vision, that we start to imagine, well, what if I start bringing two or three people every Sunday? What if, I, what if I got that family? I've been praying for them for so long. Maybe it's time for me to start calling them up Saturday night and Sunday morning and saying, let's go. Let's go to church. I'll buy you lunch after church. What if everybody in this church caught a vision, God, what can you do with my life this year? Where would we be by the end of 2016 as a church? Well, I could harp on that, but I think I'll just let the Holy Spirit work on that. I don't know how much time we have left. Could be another few hundred years. Christ could be coming back at any moment, but let's make our lives count. And Lord God, please use us in this room. Let's pray. Father, I pray that we are not people who put our hand to the plow and then look back. I pray that there's no priority in our lives greater than you, Lord. Father, help us to say yes to you. We want to spend our lives, our days for you. Lord, we saw that when the 72 obeyed you and went out and brought healing and blessing and, and the message of the kingdom, they came back rejoicing. And we saw that your heart was glad and you rejoiced. Lord, we want to make you glad. Father, I pray that our whole church is full of rejoicing because we're all serving. 
Father, please give us strength, wisdom, courage. Thank you for using us as we are. We don't have to wait to be perfect to be used by you. Thank you, God, that you're a Lord who uses willing hearts. Thank you for accepting our service, Lord. And God, for myself, personally, I want to say thank you for each person here today, all my sisters, all my brothers, Lord, that you've built such a wonderful church that I get to be a part of, Lord. Thank you, Father. I want to love you. I want to have more gratitude in my heart. Help us to chase after you all the days of our lives. Pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you for watching. Foundation TV is a ministry of Foundation Bible Church, Janesville, Wisconsin. Find us online at foundationbiblechurch.com. Foundation Bible Church, inconveniently located two blocks northwest of the Janesville Athletic Club.